Thank you very much. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for the invitation and giving me the possibility to uh, present some recent work on um, one-shot based inversion and also optimization under uncertainty. This joint work with Philip Gut and Claudia Schilling. So Philip Gut from University of Mannheim and Claudia from FU Berlin. Um, yeah, so let me start with. Yeah, with a short structure of the talk. So the first part will be on inverse problems and the incorporation of one-shot inversion. And here also some focus on ensemble common inversion as a solver for the inverse problem or the optimization problem behind. And the second part will then consider uh, optimization under uncertainty, where we treat the optimization under uncertainty as some stochastic optimization problem and uh, the stochastic optimization problem has some constraint inside and we will formulate this stochastic one-shot optimization problem corresponding to it and introduce some empirical approximation. And here the focus will be on some consistency results, when, which means that we in, uh, send uh, the underlying data to infinity. And as efficient solver, we present some stochastic gradient descent formulation. And in both uh, uh, cases, I will present some numerical experiments. Okay, let's start with some um, notation on inverse problems. So consider uh, some Hilbert space as parameter space and a possibly nonlinear uh, map H. And then we are interested in uh, recovering some unknown theta which is observed indirectly through our uh, through our forward model H. And we add some additive Gaussian noise. And then there are two uh, typically used approaches to solve these inverse problems. On the one side, we can consider optimization methods, which means that we uh, solve an optimization problem, which on the one side fits the data, the simplified form, just the least square data misfit, and we add some regularization to make the whole problem well posed. On the other side, from a more probabilistic approach, uh, there's this Bayesian, uh, Bayesian method uh, where we include some prior information incorporated uh, through a probability distribution. And then the task of Bayesian problems is to condition on the realization of the observation. And to connect both approaches, we consider the Tikhon of regularization which basically means that you add this L2 penalty term in, as a regularization function. And in a Bayesian method, this can be understood as a, a Gaussian prior information. Here for simplicity, I just uh, assume a zero mean Gaussian with a current C. And then if you want to compute the maximum of the a posterior uh, density function, we can uh, equivalently compute the minimum of this uh, Tikhonov function. Okay, and as I said, I want to uh, present you some ideas on the ensemble Kalman inversion and how to solve the inverse problems with uh, with the ensemble Kalman filter. So the basic idea of the ensemble Kalman filter is um, comes from the data simulation approach, where we have some uh, sequence of uh, some time dynamical uh, system where we, uh, which we observe sequentially. So uh, we model our current information through some probability distribution represented as a particle system. Then the first step is a prediction step using the underlying physical model. And whenever we uh, obtain measurements coming in through observations, we update our particle system uh, following base rule. So th this is the simulation step. And then we go into the next iteration. So again, using the dynamical system and uh, obtaining measurements and updating the particle system again. And the basic idea is now to uh, apply the ensemble common filter for inverse problems by introducing some tempering. So starting or recalling the posterior distribution is absolutely continuous with respect to the prior distribution. We can now incorporate an artificial time system. So instead of going one large step to the posterior from prior to the posterior, we can now do a small time step. So shifting more and more weight to the observation. So uh, this is incorporated here in this exponential where we shift more and more weight to the data misfit. And uh, this gives us the possibility now to apply the 
ensemble Kalman uh, filter to inverse problems, which leads uh, to the ensemble Kalman inversion. Here, just some notation. So we need the sample mean and the sample currencies, and then some mixed sample mean and sample currencies where we have here the, uh, the currents between the parameter space and the observation space. And what we do is basically an, a, an approximate Gaussian update step to each particle, which evolves now in this artificial time. So it is one over h. And uh, on the next slide, I want to make uh, the connection to the continuous time formulation just to motivate the whole scheme as an optimization method. So uh, rewriting the update step in a different way, this looks quite similar to some uh, tamed uh, Euler-Maruyama scheme. So here we have the drift term and the diffusion term and now leading, uh, taking the limit h, so this h uh, interpreting as a step size, sending it to zero. This leads to a coupled system of SDEs with the following form. So we have the drift term which can be understood as an approximate uh, preconditioned gradient uh, direction, which you can see on the next slide in more detail. And then we have here the diffusion part, again, by this mixed currents scaled. Okay, so there is some work on it. So firstly, the continuous time limit has been proposed in this work from Schillings and Stewart. Then there was some preliminary work, uh, which was in the simplified uh, setting where they presented some first results on uh, the convergence for taking the limit h to zero. And recently we, we have made this uh, in some form rigorous where we, uh, we proved some strong and weak convergence results for taking the limit h to zero. Okay, but why do we want to apply this as an optimization method? Well, so first of all, let's assume that our forward model is linear. So this H can be re represented as a linear operator between our parameter space and the observation space. Then the mixed currents matrix can be written as the sample currents in the parameter space and the adjoint operator of the forward model. And in particular, this is exactly here then together with this uh, data misfit, this is exactly the gradient of the least square function. So in the linear setting, we, we have that the drift term is exactly a preconditioned gradient flow where the precondition is now given by the sample currents matrix. In a nonlinear setting, this is a bit different because here we cannot uh, pull out the forward operator or it's a joint, but we can view this as an approximation. So uh, this equation holds an approximation. So an approximation, we have again this preconditioner by the sample currents matrix. And now here we have the derivative of the forward model. And in the end, we have again the gradient with respect to the least squares, uh, to the nonlinear least squares data misfit functional. So the uh, EKI in this setting can be viewed as an approximate preconditioned gradient descent method. Okay, but Let's talk about the uh, one-shot formulation. And before introducing the one-shot formulation, just to fix some notation for the neural network, which in this part will be our surrogate model, but you can use any other surrogate model. This could fit, uh, this could work exactly the same. And uh, yeah, so we, we have an input state X and our output st uh, state is denoted by P of X uh, and our weights are collected in this epsilon. So we, we have here this uh, linear update with the activation function sigma. And in the end, our neural network is understood as a functional between RD to RNL, where RNL is now just the dimension of the output vector. Okay, so let's start by how to train such neural networks or what do we want to do? So the, the idea is to approximate some functional f with our underlying uh, with the neural network. So in the end, we need to find weights such that our neural network can approximate those functions. And the very basic idea is to just use training data in order to fit the neural network to these uh, to the functional. So given 
some uh, inputs and now the uh, realization of this functional f possibly perturbed by some noise uh, we are aiming to minimize the data misfit plus possible regularization and this has been done for eki so eki can be uh, applied to train neural networks just by fitting the data points and therefore we interpret this task of minimizing the data misfit as an inverse problem so we define the forward map just by mapping to the output states of the neural network. And we consider this observation given by the training data and the task then is to recover the weights given the observations of our training data. And here, as we formulate this in, in an inverse problem, we can now simply apply EKI to train the neural network. And this has been proposed by Kowalski and Stewart. Now, uh, the, the idea, what we had in mind is to extend the training task of uh, EKI to physics-informed neural networks in some sense. So uh, in physics-informed neural networks, on the one side, you again want to approximate some functional f uh, re uh, through a neural network, but you want to incorporate the underlying physical model. So again, we have a regular data misfit, which we want to minimize but we incorporate some model regularization in some sense. And this can be, uh, can be drawn back to the original inverse problem. So uh, let's uh, keep a short overview on this. So consider just uh, inverse problem as a constraint optimization problem where our physical model is formulated by this map M. As an input, we have our underlying parameter theta and also the functional p, which represents the PDE, for example, in the background. And now in the reduced formulation, assuming that you can solve this PDE exactly given some theta, uh, we, have a uh, we, we can write down a solution operator and can formulate the inverse problems as an unconstrained optimization problem where h now represents the forward solution of the PDE. And then there's a one-shot formulation, uh, which basically means instead of solving the for, uh, this underlying PDE model exactly in each uh, for the whole optimization process, uh, we, we allow some relaxation and just add this model in L2 norm, for example, but any other norm could also work and add it as a penalty term. So we, we penalize model errors uh, for our given theta and p. And starting from this one-shot formulation, of course, we can now, uh, instead of solving this optimization problem in an infinite dimensional space, we can say, okay, let's parameterize p and solve this, uh, solve this optimization problem in a parametric way. And in particular, in our setting, we, we've chosen this parameter or we, the parameterization through a neural network. So instead of searching P in the whole infinite dimensional space, we now set our neural network. So we replace P by P epsilon, where epsilon are now the weights of the neural networks. And we aim to solve this optimization problem. But give some, uh, let's give some more details on this. So. In a classical approach, so this reduced formulation, we assume that we can solve this physical model uh, exactly. So given P, we can write down the PDE solution P and formulate this uh, uh, through a solution operator S and now defining just a forward map by H. Uh, so first solving the PDE and then incorporating this observation operator. So in the end, our forward model maps given a, a parameter maps to our uh, observation points. So in the end, we can reformulate the constraint problem as unconstrained optimization uh, problem, which we uh, saw before. But as I said, in each iteration, so when we use some iterative solver to, uh, to solve this optimization problem, we need to solve the constraint exactly. So we need to solve the PDE in each iteration exactly. And in a one-shot formulation, uh, we now keep the state P, so the PDE solution in some sense, as an optimization variable. So we don't need to solve the PDE exactly, but 
we we have an additional optimization variable now inside and in each iteration or in the whole optimization process we now solve the inverse problem in a sense that we uh, solve the optimization problem with respect to the parameter and the PDE solution at once. And in, uh, it turns out that the fault model, model is then of course not uh, solved exactly or fulfilled exactly if we have this penalty term. So let's go into the next slide, maybe it's easier. So uh, if we in, uh, include this penalty term and solve this optimization problem, of course, we cannot expect that our constraint is uh, is fulfilled exactly, but we, we can make the connection. So uh, when we incorporate this one shot formulation through an extended inverse problem where we include this equation, this model equation as an additional term in our inverse problem and assume that we have some model error, which is Gaussian, we, we get exactly this form of the L2 penalty term. And now we can view the exact formulation so this uh, constraint optimization problem as the vanishing noise term so uh, considering the limit lambda going to infinity we obtain the exact model in the end okay but how do you want to apply this now for eki so the basic idea is very similar to the ideas which have has been proposed for including tikhonov regularization so for tikhonov regularization you add this additional line for your inverse problem and you can apply EKI to, to this extended system. And now in a similar idea, we, ex, uh, we extend inverse problem now uh, through the line, uh, by the line through the forward model. So similar to the previous slide, we have now this forward model and we assume that we have a Gaussian model error. And in the end, we have this uh, extended forward map H given through this term. So we have this model error, we have the observation points and we have the parameter itself and our extended uh, observations where the model should fit the zero. This zero here gives the penalization for the L2 function. So including the tick of regularization and of course we want to fit the data in here. And then for EKI, this just means, okay, we, we simultaneously update our parameters and the weights of the neural network. So on the one side, we evaluate the neural network. We have our current um, parameters given through the particle system. And now we have our forward and observation model given on the previous slide. So we, we have this model error and we have our observations. And now obtaining the observation, uh, so the, the realization of the perturbed observation, we can now write down the EKR update step again. And in particular for a linear surrogate model, so going back where we don't use a neural network because they are of course nonlinear, but for example, if you have a linear basis representation, then you can in particular for this linear surrogate, plus some linear forward model, you can prove that EKI converts. So it solves this one-shot inversion problem. And as I said, we cannot expect that we solve the underlying system. So this uh, model M exactly, but if we simultaneously now increase the penalty parameter lambda through our EKI iteration, we can reduce the computational cost by, uh, by increasing the penalty parameter on the fly by applying EKI. And uh, just to show you some short uh, ex uh, experiment on this, we, we just had this 2D Poisson equation. So it's a linear forward model where we uh, want to recover the right-hand side. And uh, we, we include some noise on this. Uh, on the next side, you see the observation points. And now, the, uh, okay, we uh, discretize our forward model. We observe uh, 50 randomly picked points. Our uh, prior information or the underlying ground truth is given by some Gaussian random field. And now we want to apply the whole one-shot approach with the neural network approximation where our neural network is comparably pretty small. So we don't have many parameters inside, but it turned out that uh, in this particular problem, it is enough to consider 
uh, very uh, specifically small neural network. And as I said, uh, while running this continuous time formulation of EKI, we increase now the penalty parameter through this differential equation. So basically it increases a linear in time. Okay, so uh, that's our model. So on the right-hand side, we have our PDE solution, which we observe at some randomly picked points. And on the left-hand side, you can see our underlying ground truth. And if we solve the inverse problems in uh, the inverse problem in its reduced form, including some Tikhonov factorization, uh, you obtain this approximation. And now, if we uh, compare it to the proposed approach where we include the neural network approximation or the neural network one-shot approach. On the right-hand side, you can see the uh, PDE solution, which uh, fits nearly perfect the observation or, or, the, or the current truth of the PDE solution. And on the left-hand side, you can see our approximation of the underlying current true uh, uh, parameter. And of course, we should compare to this Tikhonov solution because we included the Tikhonov factorization. And just to plot some errors, uh, left-hand side, of course, uh, as we have uh, the regularization within, we cannot expect that we fit the data uh, perfectly, but uh, still we see that the neural network approximates the uh, PDE solution quite well. And on the right-hand side, the more interesting plot is the model error. So increasing the penalty parameter. So on the x-axis, we see the uh, increasing penalty parameter and as the time processes the penalty parameter increases and with this also our model error decreases as we expected okay um yeah so first of all some questions right now for the first part okay so i Yes, then I can continue with the second part. Um, yeah. I think we have to turn it on. Oh. I'm sorry. Here? Oops. Oh, here we go. Um, hello, Simon. Hi. Um, so I, I'm always a bit puzzled with this ensemble common erosion because it seems it's relatively slowly converging to zero. I mean, like to the, I mean, if you, I, I assume you run to infinity, right? So the rate of convergence is one or more sort of the, the time somehow, right? So it's, it's, it's polynomial. Yeah. Other methods would be maybe exponentially converging or so? Um, yeah, that, it depends on the underlying optimization problem. If you have convexity, of course, for EKI, you need uh, convexity as well to prove convergence. Then, of course, you get uh, exponential convergence if you apply, for example, gradient descent. Uh, but the key difference is that EKI remains derivative free. So that's one motivation. Of course, if you can compute derivatives in a suitable way such that it's not too expensive, then gradient descent should beat EKI, I would say. Right. Um... Yeah, okay. But yeah, I guess there are other ways of getting derivative free methods. Uh, but anyway, is it, is, it, is, it, is it, I mean, in your simulations, do you see this as a problem or is it not so much an issue that it's slowly converging? Um, so, right now, well, so the, the experiments were not too extensive. Uh, so, here we did not see a problem to running EKI. But I have to admit, I did not compare to gradient descent in this particular problem. Uh, we, we only compared to um, to solving the whole problem when having a large penalty parameter. And this is, of course, numerically very instable. So starting with lambda very large and then using some optimization solver just from a MATLAB toolbox, uh, this was very uh, instable. But we only compared uh, to those settings. We did not compare to just applying gradient descent. I mean, of course, there's another thing that's attractive about the uh, common filter. It's it's a fine invariant, right? So it's like Newton's method. So you don't yep. need to worry about this. That, that's a nice thing, right? Um, okay, okay, anyway, thank you. Any further questions? 
Not from here, and also I think there are no questions in the chat. Okay, then let's continue with the second part. Um, yeah, so it's a bit different. So going away from EKI for a moment, or in this part, uh, we don't consider EKI at all. Um, yeah, so we consider this PDE constraint optimization problem under uncertainty. So we have this risk functional given by some L2 expected value uh, with a um, co uh, control set. And now we, our constraint is that this PDE is uh, satisfied almost surely in Y. So we have this uh, random uh, diffusion coefficient, which for example, could be represented by some uh, uh, by some basis uh, representation. Um, yeah, but that's just a motivating example. The theory, I would say, is a bit more general in the end. Um, but keep uh, keeping this example in mind, uh, so one idea how to solve this, optimis uh, this constraint optimization problem is now in a reduced formulation. So first of all, parameterization of the uh, diffusion coefficient by, for example, through some cohen loew expansion, then you, you can consider the weak formulation for the underlying PDE problem. If you can show that this PDE in itself is well posted, that you can solve the PDE given some random diffusion coefficient or some uh, random co uh, coefficients in your KL expansion, then you can write down the solution operator again, which you can plug in into the up uh, into the objective functional and in the end you end up again by some unconstrained optimization problem on the other side now this one shot formulation strategy does not plug in the solution operator ex explicitly but again similar as in our inverse problem setting we now add the constraint as a penalty parameter um, where the penalty parameter now again lambda k in the end, we aim to send this penalty parameter to infinity to get more and more accurate uh, solutions or more and more accurate model errors. So the model error should be small. So in the end, our estimate will be the set star u of set star for k going to infinity. So this is what we want to show in the end. Okay, but similar as before, now in this one-shot formulation, instead of solving this whole problem in an infinite dimensional space, we just plug in again a parametric uh, representation of our PDE solution, which in this setting is kept very general. So just some functional now depending on finite dimensional parameters. And the advantage here, uh, should be that uh, we can evaluate this surrogate model cheap. So we could use it in post-processing applications, for example. Uh, we learn the surrogate model on the fly. So while solving the whole constraint optimization problem, we also learn the surrogate model. And uh, we should mention that the surrogate model is only trained for this particular optimal control parameter. So when repeating the experiment with a different optimal control parameter, you would need to learn this parameter again. But on the other side, we would expect that our training data does not need to be too large to train the surrogate model because we don't want to represent too much. So uh, reformulating now the whole problem with the surrogate model inside again, we, we have this unconstrained optimization problem where we, we have our surrogate model here in the penalty term and also in the uh, in this L2 risk functional. And just some examples for surrogates, of course, you can choose whatever you prefer to use as a surrogate model. And now just to simplify some notation. So as I said, we don't need to consider this uh, particular PDE example, which, we ha uh, which I had on uh, the previous slides. We can use again, some, just some model error represented through this M. And now the penalty is given by this functional G where X is now our, uh, our variable in our optimization problem and Y is the underlying random coefficient, which does not need to be represented in some KL expansion. It is just some random variable, let's say. 
And our objective function is given through this functional f, where we have, again, this L2 functional plus this virtualization, which in this particular setting is deterministic. Yeah, and now we are interested in proving some consistency for those problems. So starting in our original problem, we had this constraint risk minimization problem. So we have this expected value in the loss function, and we have this constraint given through this expected value, which needs to be zero. And the first idea or the, the first approach was to include this one-shot formulation, which basically means this penalization of the risk uh, minimization problem. So represented through this lambda k. And afterwards, we include some empirical approximation of the expected value. So for example, or in our particular setting, we assume that we have the IID representation of the underlying random variable. So just have an IID sample of it. And then we replace the expected values uh, through standard Monte Carlo uh, approximations. And now the idea is to consider the limit lambda k going to infinity and also the sample size going to infinity. So in the end, we want to approximate the constraint optimization problem solution, but we only solve the unconstrained and also empirical uh, risk minimization problem. And now we, we divide the error into the risk minimization problem to the penalty problem. So if, uh, going, uh, uh, if we go back to this slide, we, we go back from three to two, and afterwards we go back from two to one. So in the end, we divide this error in the empirical error coming from our uh, Monte Carlo approximation of the expected value. And uh, it's uh, well known from penalty optimization. We can now also control the error in the coming from just from including the constraint as a penalty term. So for the left hand side, we basically need some convexity assumptions on the underlying uh, risk functional and also on the constraint functional, assuming just that the variances are bounded uniformly in the penalty term. Uh, then we can prove that uh, that we exactly get again this Monte Carlo rate for our optimization problem. So independent now of this penalty parameter, we can bound the error in this uh, in the opt uh, solution of the empirical approximated uh, objective function to the uh, to the penalized but risk minimization function. And on the other side, uh, if we go from the penalty term to the constraint optimization problem, uh, we basically need some regular regularity conditions on the functional. So in particular, we need that our constraint is non-degenerate and our, uh, if we write down a Lagrangian operate, uh, Lagrangian functional that this one is self-adjoint and positive definite over optimal solutions. So the hedging of it, and uh, then we can prove that independent of the sample size, of course, because we have here no data included, that we can bound the error given through this penalty parameter. And in the end, to combine both lemmata, uh, we, we obtain the consistency of the underlying estimator for this uh, optimization problem, which now divides the error in the sample size and in the uh, and in the uh, penalty parameter. Okay, there were quite many uh, assumptions in it, but again, after discretization, so discretizing the underlying uh, PDE, uh, and now including a linear surrogate model, for example, again, some linear basis representation, we can verify those assumptions. Okay. Um, yeah, but uh, solving the whole problem. So if you assume that you have a very large data space, so uh, many data points of Y, this, uh, solving this problem for a very large penalty parameter should be very, uh, very expensive because you have to solve uh, for uh, how to solve a penalty uh, penalized uh, 
functional is typically in a sequence of penalty parameters increasing. And this means that you have to solve many uh, optimization problems where this objective function is uh, costly to evaluate, for example. So we propose to, uh, to apply some penalized thoracic gradient descent method where we adaptively increase the penalty term. So assuming that we have an IID sequence of Y, uh, we now apply just a thoracic gradient descent up, uh, update step, but increase the penalty parameter on the fly within this thoracic gradient descent method. And again, some convexity assumptions on the underlying uh, objective function J, where we now plug in the, uh, a large penalty term. So we know that uh, the penalty, uh, the penalized uh, objective function or the solution of it is consistent with respect to this constraint problem. So we aim to solve this uh, problem with a very large penalty parameter. Then we uh, assume some, uh, just some variance cross conditions of our underlying uh, gradients. And we assume that we can have some boundedness on a compact uh, set within our interval. And now if we increase the penalty parameter with a certain rate represented uh, through our step sizes, we can prove that indeed we converge to the uh, solution of this penalized uh, objective function in the end. And uh, here this uh, constant, uh, or this uh, sequence of constants CK is uh, converging to zero in number of iterations approaching infinity. Okay, and uh, I will close uh, with a short numeric experiment again. So we, we had back to our motivating example now. Uh, we discretize with a piecewise linear finite elements. We have a KL expansion with a uniformly distributed coefficients. Our expected value uh, is represented by 100 Monte Carlo points. And then we use some TensorFlow implementation of Adam, which includes some uh, moments uh, methods for thoracic gradient. And we consider two different surrogate models. On the one side, we have uh, orthogonal Lochand polynomials up to degree three. And uh, we have a, a deep neural network of this form where the deep neural network is chosen such that the number of weights we need to learn increase or uh, is represented of a similar order for Lechant polynomials up to degree two. Okay, so uh, our first experiment, here we solve now the constraint optimization problem. Uh, on the one side, we increase the sample size n, but keep the penalty parameter lambda k fixed. And uh, we, we obtain exactly what we expected uh, through our numerical methods. Here we have uh, the linear surrogate parameter. So just to verify our theoretical analysis. And on the other side, we can increase the penalty parameter, but, fix, uh, but fixing a sample size. And exactly again, here we see the expected rate. So here we did not apply uh, any thoracic gradient method. But now in, in this uh, next plots, we applied our thoracic gradient descent method. We, we compared uh, the control and also the model error for the different surrogate models. And of course, here we ob observe that for smaller surrogate models, we come to the border of approximation uh, possibilities. So if we don't have uh, too much included uh, parameters or uh, weights for our surrogate model, we cannot expect that we can represent the whole underlying uh, solution of the PDE. And uh, just the last plot, uh, here we consider again the model error. So including, uh, again, we compare our different surrogate models uh, and we see that uh, at least we can decrease the model error, so the underlying constraint quite well. 
And of course, if we increase now the uh, weights or the approximation possibilities of our surrogate models, these error decrease uh, even more. And on the right hand side, we see the difference to our uh, to our uh, target state u zero, which we aim to fit. Yeah, so that's for the numerical experiment, and just some summary uh, for the whole talk. So we we have proposed a flexible framework for training surrogate models during the optimization process. And uh, in particular, we train the surrogate model at once with the optimal control or in the inverse problem setting with the optimal parameters. And in particular for this optimal control application, uh, we are able then afterwards to apply the surrogate model for post-processing. So if you are, exam uh, for example, again, interested in some inverse problems, afterwards you could apply this the surrogate model. And as an outlook, of course, you're interested in deriving some approximation results. So can we solve those constraints exactly? Uh, and how large should the surrogate be in this setting? Uh, on the other side, we are interested in tuning the efficiency of the training algorithms, for example, including for the stochastic gradient descent, some variance reduction method. And of course, our numerical experiments were not too extensive. So this could also be a further direction to test the whole ideas to different uh, other numerical experiments, which are more extensive. And with this, thanks for your attention. <laughs>